take a couple of good long deep in and out breaths. Think of the breath energy sweeping through the whole body. Cleaning out all the cobwebs, cleaning out all the little corners where the energy tends to get stagnant. And if long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it feels tiring, then you can choose another rhythm. Shorter, more shallow. Faster, slower, heavier, lighter. Try to see what your body needs right now. Don't get tied down by the perception that when you're meditating, the breath has to be gentle or it has to be shallow or whatever. For there to be concentration, you can concentrate on all kinds of breathing, but you want to listen to what your body needs right now. Pay close attention. This way you get to see things you didn't see before inside, both in the body and in the mind. Because as the mind begins to gather around the breath like this, when you give it one thing to stick with, you begin to see other movements in the mind, other intentions that may come up, other thoughts, referring to the past, referring to the future. And you don't notice them unless you're telling yourself, okay, I've got to be here in the present moment. Otherwise you just kind of ride around with them. If you draw a map of where the mind went in the course of a day, it would be all over the place. It would be tangled more than a bird's nest. And if you were asked to draw that map, you'd, you'd be at a loss. You know, when you went from one thought to the next, what was the transition? But when you're sitting here meditating, you can see the thoughts come and you can see them go. Not that you want to get interested enough to draw the map. But just realize you're in a better position now, outside of the thoughts. That's one of the purposes of the meditation, is to step outside of this constant chatter inside. And you do that first, of course, by talking to yourself about the breath. Asking yourself, is it comfortable? If it's not comfortable, what can be done to make it more comfortable? If it is comfortable, how do you protect it? Those are legitimate things to be asking. But they also require that you be very attentive. You probably know the story about the overflowing cup. Someone goes to the Zen master and he's full of opinions, and the Zen master parts, <clears throat> starts pouring tea into the cup. And he keeps pouring and pouring and pouring. It's overflowing. And finally the visitor says, wait a minute, you're, why do you continue pouring tea into the cup? It's full. And the Zen Master said, it was the same way. If I tried to teach you, it would be like pouring water into a cup that's already full. And John Chai added that the, the tea in the cup is probably dirty. People come, he says, with opinions, and it's like their cups filled with dirty water. And one of the first things you've got to do is throw it out. Well, it's not just in terms of our opinions when we're listening to the Dharma. We go through the day with our cups full of tea, full of water. Sometimes it is dirty water. In other words, we bring a lot of things to our encounters with other people, and they're just simply our encounters with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. When the Buddha set out the factors for dependent core rising, you notice that sensory contact happens in the middle of the factors, which means a lot of things happen beforehand. And it's easy to get entangled in the details of dependent core rising to miss the point that what the Buddha is saying is you're suffering because of what you bring to your experience of the world. We bring a cup, a full, a full cup, often full of dirty water. That's why we don't like drinking the water, because it's not clean. So we've got to learn to pour it out. And just stay with the sensation of the breath and sen simple sensations in the present moment and see how much you can pare down your conversation around that. As the breath gets more and more comfortable, it's easier to pare things down. So focus on that. Make that your purpose in being here right now, to find 
way of breathing that feels really good. And if you can think of that sense of well-being then spreading from whatever spot you're focused on, you get more and more anchored in the present. And as things begin to calm down in the body, that has a soothing effect on the mind. And the chatter can get more and more subtle. That's when your chatter gets more subtle. That's when you can see the other thoughts that are there. Sometimes they hide out while you're in concentration. You have to wait till you're coming out to catch the fact that as soon as you leave the breath, you're going to jump on something else. And you've already got a story prepared for it. You have to learn how to question those stories. Now, this is not saying that the world outside doesn't have bad things, or the people outside aren't doing bad people. We're not here to assign blame as to who's right and who's wrong, who's good or who's bad. The question is, who's skillful? Are you skillful in handling all the difficulties of the world? And this is something you can do something about if you try to straighten out the whole world before you sat down to meditate or before you worked on your mind. Nothing would ever get straightened out, because there are a lot of people who resist. But if you focus inside, that's something that you can do something about. Again, this is not assigning blame. It's simply saying this is the most effective place to to look to solve the problem. Then you find that the problem really is the suffering that you create for yourself. There's stress out there in the world, but that's just part of the world. It's what you take on by feeding on things. Again, this is a lot of what we bring to a situation. The question is, what can I feed on? What can I feed on? Where can I get some pleasure here? And then when you're disappointed in not getting the pleasure you wanted, then, then you get upset. So we have to learn to be more content with what we can get from outside so we can see that the real problem is inside. When the Buddha talks about contentment, it's interesting. He says there's some things that you endure and other things that you don't. The things you endure are harsh words, hurtful words, and physical pains. And if you can learn how to endure those things, then you find that it's easier to stay in any kind of situation, whatever the food, whatever the clothing, whatever the shelter, and you're fine. What you don't endure, he says, are unskillful thoughts when they arise in the mind. You don't want to just let them hang out there and put down roots or fill up more dirty water into your cup. You've got to throw them out, throw them out. And the Buddha lists the thoughts that are involved with sensuality, in other words, your fascination with planning sensual pleasures, thoughts of ill will, hoping to see other people suffer, and thoughts of harmfulness. Now, there's not just waiting them for the suffer for them to suffer on their own. You're going to do something to see if you can hurry up the suffering. All of those kinds of thinking said you should not endure at all. Don't let them hang out in the mind. So again, the emphasis is not so much on the situation outside, but it's what you bring to the situation that you've got to be careful about. If you are more and more alert and aware of what you're bringing, and you can see that it's causing suffering, then, then you can drop it. The Buddha gives you alternative ways of thinking. There's a great passage where there's a monk who's going out to a pretty rough area of India. And the Buddha says before he goes, it's a pretty rough area. What are you going to do if those people yell at you? He says, well, I think they're very good and civilized and that they're not hitting me. What if they hit you? At least not, they're not hitting me with a stone. What if they hit you with a stone? Well, at least they're not stabbing me with a knife. What if they stab you with a knife? He said, I'll tell myself they're good and civilized. At least they're not killing me. What if they kill you? At least my death wouldn't have been a suicide. The voice says, OK, you're ready to go. So remember, that's an alternative way of thinking. We get worked up about what other people do or they say. But if you learn how to bring the right attitude, 
you don't have to suffer from what they do or they say. They can still be wrong, they can still be saying horrible things. But no matter how wrong or horrible they may be, you realize you have the choice, that you don't have to suffer from that. And that gives you a lot of power. So if you find you're suffering from the situation, ask yourself, well, what am I bringing to the situation that's making me suffer? Maybe you've got lots and lots of salt water in your cup and it's almost undrinkable, and then someone else throws in a little bit of salt in and that goes over the top. If you can throw out your salt water, then that little bit of salt that they throw in is not going to be all that bad. Again, we're not assigning blame. If you're suffering, they don't say, well, you're suffering because you're just bad. It's simply a lack of skill. The feeling that you're a bad person, you go around with a lot of guilt, but it doesn't encourage that either. Because if you're carrying thoughts of guilt, the mind will tend to rebel. It'll put up with the thoughts of guilt for a while, and then it'll start throwing that out to other people. It's like you've got muddy water in your cup, and you have your way of emptying it is throwing it on others. And then you feel guilty again, and you go back and forth like this. When you recognize that you have made a mistake, the Buddha says, recognize it was a mistake, resolve not to repeat it, and then spread lots of goodwill to yourself and others. You spread goodwill to yourself as a way of encouraging yourself. You're doing this for your true happiness. You spread it to others to remind yourself that you don't want to harm them again. You don't want to repeat the mistake. It gives you more and more motivation not to repeat it. So a sense of guilt is also dirty water that you bring. That situation, so you just drop it and replace it with goodwill. So try to be very attentive to what you're bringing to the situation, what kind of water you've got in your cup. And getting the mind to be still like this with a sense of well-being, puts you in a much better position not only to recognize that you've got some bad stuff in your cup, but also to realize how you can throw it away. You don't have to keep carrying it around. This is a very empowering practice may not enable us to change the world, doesn't give us that kind of power, but it does give us the power. We don't have to keep on creating suffering for ourselves on and on and on the way we've been doing. We can bring a noble attitude to life. And that attitude puts some really good water in our cup.